Subtick was not a beneficial addition to CS2, and it isn't a hill worth dying on. There, I said it. And in the next few minutes, I'm gonna explain how Subtick works and why it's a liability. First off, before we get into the intricacies of Subtick, we need to have a basic understanding of how Subtick based games work at a fundamental level, how the movement is calculated in the Source Engine, and what Subtick actually is. Let's start with the movement in Source Engine based games. All we need to know here is that your character moves by you inputting a direction and the game then creates an acceleration vector in this direction. Then acceleration is calculated by taking the SV accelerate variable, the max speed you are aiming for, which would be 250 units per second with your knife out and slightly less for other equipment except the C4. And finally the friction multiplayer of the ground below your character, which in CS2 and CSGO is pretty much always one. This acceleration is then added to your velocity and your character starts to move. However, as soon as you have some velocity, there's a friction vector in the opposite movement direction that counteracts the acceleration based on how fast you're currently moving, but before the acceleration, the friction vector is actually applied. So with the movement done, let's quickly go over tick-based input structures. Basically, everything physics-based be it the application of acceleration to your velocity or, for instance, collisions with other models, is updated exclusively on every tick. This more or less means the game only exists in intervals of 1 64th of a second and everything in between can only be approximated by math. These ticks will always happen exactly 15.6 milliseconds after each other. No exceptions. Next. The game needs to know how to update the game state at these ticks, so we kinda need to poll for user inputs. And this input polling is actually done in a continuous timeline, meaning your button pressed will be accepted anytime, even in between ticks, where every frame, so most likely a lot more frequently than 1 64th of a second, the game locks your key presses, with the only exception being your view angles, or your crosshair position, which is locked exactly on ticks. These inputs are then stored in a structure, simply telling the game whether a key was pressed or not in the time span between the last tick and the current one. And based on this information, the physics are updated accordingly each tick, meaning when you press W, your velocity will only change exactly at the next tick, which is also the moment where you'll notice that your character starts to move. Now onto the last preliminary topic. How does Subtick change the tick-based structure? Well, you're gonna be surprised, since Subtick is nothing else than a simple timestamp and a bit of math. If you look at our timeline again, the game is still updated every 1 64th of a second, but the difference to before is the way how inputs are locked and how the physics parts are updated afterwards on a tick. Basically, for tick-based systems, it doesn't matter when you press a button between ticks, as the game will simply lock whether you pressed it anywhere in the time span between the last tick and the current one, but for sub-tick, the game actually attaches a time value to every button press, where the time value holds the time in milliseconds of how long after the last tick you press the key. And that's it. That's the entirety of the subtick part. So what this allows us to do now is to actually be able to tell when a physics update was supposed to be applied. And with this information every tick update, we can just pretend like the movement actually started back when the key was pressed in between ticks and interpolate the velocity that would now be present at the current tick. And this nicely sums up everything you need to know in order to understand what we will be talking about in the next few minutes. So why is subtick a liability now? Well, simply put, because it's trying to force a system that is omnipresent and exists 24 seven onto another system that only really exists every 1 64th of a second. While this technically allows for more accurate inputs, the result are huge inconsistencies when seemingly performing an identical action on multiple occasions. To showcase this with an in-game experiment and some math later on, all we gotta do is to look at the movement in CS2, where movement is being able to start in between ticks and then interpolate it at an actual tick. For instance, if we look at this scuffed arch that is supposed to showcase your height when jumping in-game, and please excuse the drawing, I'm a programmer and not an artist after all. Notice how in a non subtick system, the apex of the jump will always occur exactly two ticks after you started to gain height, and how on the first tick after jumping, you're always on the same exact height, no matter on which tick you started the jump. When you're pressing the jump key, the result will always be consistent and predictable. 
For sub tick, we can adapt the same graph by freely moving the start of the jumping motion in between ticks. So if we move it slightly to the right, the arch will mathematically be identical to before, thanks to interpolation, but the issue is that we are trying to force a continuous timescale onto a timescale that only exists every 1 64th of a second again. Now, if we once again look at the supposed apex of the jump, and please remember from before that physics are only updated exactly on a tick in both sub-tick and non-sub-tick architectures. Your evaluated height is a considerably amount lower than on the tick-based system. So basically, your maximum jump height evaluated in-game is depending on how far into a tick you press space, or in other words, the same action leads to different results. But credit where credit is due, since as far as I know, the jump height issue was mitigated by Valve and only happens very infrequently now. However, there is another issue. They might have fixed the apex of jumps, but what about a collision occurring anywhere before you hit your max height in a jump? Or in other words, if you bump into something and bounce off of it while you were jumping. Well, since you can't fix everything with band aids, this is an inconsistency still present in the game, which can easily be showcased as well. Just stand underneath the arch in Mirage T-Spawn and jump. You'll quickly notice that for every jump you make, you land in a slightly different position every time, since, again, the upwards velocity your character has when bumping into the arch will vary and depend on how far into a tick you press your jump key. With a D-Sub tick config, you'll always land in the exact same spot. So, with inconsistent jumping proved, what about other movements, especially your acceleration, which is especially crucial when jiggle peeking? Well, it's the same story here, except that our acceleration curve looks slightly different. And this time, we can even prove it by using some math taken directly from the code of the source engine. In CSGO, movement was calculated like this, where your velocity at any tick is the result of your last velocity, slowed down by friction, and then the added acceleration. The exact formulas are as follows. The values for SV Accelerate, SV Friction and SV Stop Speed are server variables and we can simply look them up in the console, but their default values are 5.5, 5.2 and 80 respectively. On a tick-based system, the frame time will always be 15.6 milliseconds since this is the time passed between ticks. The current speed is a temporary value designed to slow you down with friction by a minimum amount. So if your velocity is lower than SV stop speed, the game will slow you down as if you are moving at the value of SV stop speed. Otherwise, it's using your actual velocity. And using these numbers, we can calculate the speed at each tick if we were to run from a standstill until we reach max speed with the knife out. For sub-tick movement, the equations are the same except for the first two ticks when movement occurs. In the first tick, where movement is detected, the game now applies the acceleration scaled to the amount of time of a tick when you press down your key, which means you're no longer getting the acceleration of a whole tick, but rather only a fraction of it. In the second tick, the acceleration function is called twice, where the first call is with the remaining time of the first tick, and the second call uses up the remaining time of the second tick, which coincidentally is the same amount of time as the initial sub-tick and it also lines us with the tick-based system again. From the third tick onwards, the function is called once per tick again and with the time value of a whole tick. Using these rules, we can again calculate the velocity for each tick, depending on how far into a tick we pressed our movement key, and then ultimately compare the tables. And the difference is actually crazy. Here's a graph showcasing the difference in speed between sub-ticked and non-sub-tick movement. The velocity difference at the first tick is especially egregious and could very well be responsible for why the movement in CS2 feels so heavy. Another thing you should notice is that the lines aren't meeting at the end, which is due to non-sub-tick movement reaching the maximum velocity one whole tick earlier than sub-tick movement. So there are four main takeaways we can draw from this comparison. Sub-tick movement is always slower in terms of acceleration, especially in the first tick, making it feel like your character has a different inertia each time. It is also always slower than tick-based movement, and it takes longer to fully accelerate to a max speed by exactly one tick. And lastly, the further into a tick you input your movement key, the bigger the speed difference, which greatly increases the effect of the resulting inconsistency. So we have again proven that Subtick doesn't do us any favors here, but rather makes the entire movement in the game inconsistent. If you're interested in the calculations I did for the movement, I'll link my Excel sheet in the description below. Now, with the definitive proof in hand that Subtick is a liability, what could be a compromise between using Subtick and not having your movement be inconsistent? Well, easy enough. 
one could just revert back to a tick-based movement and only use subtick for its higher precision when shooting, where it actually makes sense. You see, even though the physics are updated each tick, the player models are technically still moving in between ticks by interpolation, so when shooting, it actually does matter when you're pressing mouse 1. And for the server to then revert back to the tick where you fired your shot, and then interpolating the character model you were shooting at to its according position in between ticks, you really don't need subtick for. This would make shooting more accurate than in CSGO, while still giving players access to a consistent form of movement, and is in my opinion the best case scenario. But will Valve ever change anything about subtick? I'm afraid the answer is no, and we will be forever stuck with it. And if this is the case, an okay-ish trade-off would be to reduce the worst case scenarios, where you input a movement key just before the end of a tick, which leads to the greatest difference when compared to CSGO's tick-based movement. This could be achieved by upgrading the server tick rate to 128 ticks, since the ground truth of the game would be updated more often, leaving the game with less time in between ticks to interpolate. Anyhow, if you enjoyed the video, you can leave a like or subscribe to my channel for more CS content, and if you have anything on your mind, you can hit me up in the comments below or on Discord. As always, have a nice day, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!